Hey, church, how y'all doing? You can be seated. I couldn't wait to get here. Not many uh, places I would go when I'm on holidays and your pastor is like, you know what, you need to come. And um, how many know that the, the Holy Ghost can just like make you do things you don't want to do? Uh, I, but, but, but I actually really do want to do this. I love your pastors. I love, love Pastor Benny, Pastor Wendy. You know, and it's... Um, sometimes you could know, you could just say things and then you've, um, 20 years down the track, and I met Pastor Benny probably about 22 years ago now, like um, when we were both like one years old, but um, at <laughs> 22 years ago, um, I had heard about um, a guy that was just doing, uh, really seeing God do amazing things when it came to signs and wonders and miracles here in America, and we were both a lot younger than I'm 40 eight and a half nowadays so back then we were just um, starting youth ministry and um, I knew we, we wanted that in Australia uh, big time and there was another um, uh, another minister that was overseeing our movement and it was like you know we've got to have this guy and um, you know he came in and really something so major started then that birthed something in Australia is just such a hunger a lot of what you see today uh, you see uh, different music coming out of Hillsong Worship. You see different things coming out of United. They were all kids in a youth group when we were all preaching those youth camps back then. No, nobody would have thought anything. They would tell you the same thing. They were teenagers, young, young teenagers. And um, God birthed something way back then. And, you know, a lot of people, they just don't give God enough time. You just stick around long enough. I say to everyone, the only reason God's using me so powerfully is by the time you get to my age, he's running out of options. And um, <laughs> most people gave up. And, you know, you know, you just kind of, you'll outlast the devil and you'll outlast most Christians. And then by the time you get to nearly 50, God goes, I need somebody. And you're still here and nobody else is it. So God goes, tag, you're it. I guess I'm going to look good if I use you. So that's really my secret to success if you're wondering it really really isn't much more than that but a lot of that came out of your pastor and um and then out of that I came and um, went to pastor Wendy's parents church and um back then there was a, a, a again he was maybe 20 Judah was at that time and um I remember hearing him at a camp maybe it was in Portland there was a summer youth camp what was that called oh who knows but it was that's it generation yeah and I heard this 20-year-old kid and um, I started weeping and I called from the service, I called my pastor. And I've only ever done this about two people in my whole life at Hillsong and I've been part of the teaching team there for 27 years. And I started weeping and I said, there's this young kid um, preaching. And I said, the anointing of God is so unbelievable. I said, I haven't found this around the world. And I just started uh, weeping in the middle of that service. I can still tell you what he preached on, seven generations of, of blessing. I mean, it was so powerful. And um, who would have known then how God orchestrates everything? And now we're all so connected and we're one, one big worldwide global family. And then God turns it full circle that I'm in Las Vegas with the single most ravishing piece of masculine flesh on planet Earth. And, um, and our two daughters, we have two little daughters, a 13-year-old Catherine Bobby and my nine-year-old Sophia Joyce, named after two of the most influential women in my life, Catherine Bobby, my pastor of 27 years, and um, Sophia Joyce, my spiritual mum, uh, Joyce Meyer. So they're like, um, you know, but I say they are alpha and omega of my childbearing years, the beginning and the end, because my husband is the 12th of 13 living children. His mother had 15 full-term pregnancies in 17 years. I know there was like no television in that part of Australia. But anyway, so I, his mother never thought you were a woman until you popped out number 10. So I felt this moral obligation to say to my mother-in-law, this is Alpha and Omega. This is where it begins and it ends. I didn't have my first child till 35, didn't pop out my second until 40, so I'm already going to be 150 at my kid's 21st. And so <laughs> we, we are um, all here on vacation, but God, but God is doing something so awesome. You know, when God's doing something so awesome, I said to Nick, when, when you're called, you're not building a career, so you're not looking for time off from doing what God has called you to do. And so I have never gotten to where I am because I was building some kind of career, and this is my sacred time off, and this is my work time. You just respond to the call of God. And sometimes that call comes at eight o'clock in the morning on a text on your phone, and you go, you know what? This is a God moment, and um, I refuse to ever make my Christianity a Christian career. It's always a call following Jesus. You'll go a lot further following him. He'll give you a lot more grace, a lot more energy, a lot more strength. Never, ever make yourself a professional Christian 
or you'll lose the moment. So I'm excited. I'm excited with what God's doing through your movement. And I believe he's given me a word for you this morning. We don't, we don't need another church service. Time is too urgent. The hour on the, uh, on the planet is too urgent. I'm not looking for more meetings and you're not looking for more meetings. We are looking for divine encounters so that we could continue to advance the kingdom of God. We had Easter Sunday, but I thank God that we're a resurrection people. It is Easter Sunday every Sunday. We continue to go forward. We continue to lay a hold of God. So I want you to turn with me to the book of Joshua chapter 6. I feel this strongly and let's believe God is going to speak something into your heart. The scripture says in Joshua 6, now Jericho, oh, we'll, let's start at Joshua chapter 5. Now when all of the Amorite kings west of the Jordan and all the Canaanite kings along the coast heard how the Lord had dried up the Jordan before the Israelites until we had crossed over. Their hearts melted and they no longer had the courage to face the Israelites. At that time, the Lord said to Joshua, make flint knives and circumcise the Israelites again. Everyone say again. Circumcise the Israelites again. So Joshua made flint knives and circumcised the Israelites at Gilbeath Harath. I'm so glad I'm a woman. Now this is why he did so. All those who came out of Egypt, all the men of military age, died in the desert on the way after leaving Egypt. All the people that had come out had been circumcised. But all the people born in the desert during the journey from Egypt had not. We'll just pick it up further down in verse 10. On the evening of the 14th day of the month, while camped at Gilgal on the plains of Jericho, the Israelites celebrated the Passover. The day after the Passover, that very day, they ate some of the produce of the land, unleavened bread and roasted grain. The manna stopped the day after they ate this food from the land. There was no longer any manna for the Israelites, but that day, but that year they ate of the produce of Canaan. Now when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him. Oh, for the sake of time, let's just jump to chapter 6, verse 1. You can go home and read it all. The whole Bible's really good, but you're going to particularly read um, chapter 5 and 6 when you go home so that you know that I'm on point. But I want to save some time here. So chapter 6, Scripture says, Now Jericho was tightly shut up because of the Israelites. No one went out, no one came in. Then the Lord said to Joshua, See, I've delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its king and its fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry the trumpets of ram's, ram's horns in front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have all the people give a loud shout. Then the wall of the city will collapse and the people will go up, every man straight in. So Joshua, son of Nun, called the priests, said to them, Take up the ark of the covenant of the Lord and have seven priests carry trumpets in front of it. And he ordered the people advance, march a around the city with the armed guard going ahead of the ark of the Lord. When Joshua had spoken to the people, the seven priests carrying the seven trumpets before the Lord went forward blowing their trumpets and the ark of the Lord's covenant followed them. The armed guard marched ahead of the priests who blew the trumpets and the rear guard followed the ark. All this time the trumpets were sounding and I've read all this to get to verse 10. But Joshua had commanded the people, do not give a war cry, do not raise your voices, do not say a word until the day I tell you to shout, then shout. Now, for the sake of time, let me quickly contextualize this for you. For 430 years, the children of Israel, they were in bondage, they were in slavery, they were in captivity, crying out to God to set them free. The Lord set them free and um, He delivered them. He delivered them out of bondage. He delivered them out of slavery. They were no longer being physically abused by the Egyptians. They were no longer being beaten, working 19-hour days and being given very uh, little food, having no rights, no privileges. 430 years. Years, they were slaves. The Lord, through a series of signs and wonders and miracles, delivered them miraculously. He parted the Red Sea. He drowned the Egyptian army. He kept them alive in the wilderness for 40 years. I mean, God did a lot of signs and wonders and miracles. So what you have is 430 years delivered. They came out of slavery, out of bondage, but they weren't yet free. And a lot of Christians don't understand the difference between deliverance and freedom. Freedom was going to be in Canaan. Freedom is in the promised land. Freedom was never in the wilderness. They had what Deuteronomy says, an 11-day journey between bondage and freedom. There was an 11-day journey, Deuteronomy chapter 1, but the Bible says in verse 3, now it came to pass in the 40th year. What should have only taken 11 days ended up taking 40 years. So many Christians end up taking 40 years doing laps around Mount Sinai, laps around the same old mountains of offense, of bitterness, of shame, of guilt, of condemnation, of lust, of greed, of envy, taking 40 years to do what should only take 11 days. And they end up dying 
dying, delivered, but never free. And so it is for freedom that Jesus Christ came to set us free. So for 40 years, they're trapped in the world. A lot of Christians, I, I come from a background like that, like many of you, you would need to be a prophet in a room like this. I was left in a hospital in Sydney, Australia, unnamed and unwanted when I was born. In fact, my birth certificate simply says, next to the category that says child's name, typed in is the word unnamed, number 2508 of 1966. That's why with all our work with the victims of human trafficking, numbers, numbers are numbing, numbers are dehumanizing, numbers are desensitizing. It's easy to ignore suffering when it's nameless and faceless and it's just a number. But you see, if I put my certificate up and it said number 2508, unnamed, all of a sudden when you know it's me, it changes everything. Now God knows every number. God knows everyone is not a statistic. God knows everyone really matters. None are like that. I was also abused for 12 years sexually abused at the hands of four men. And, and so I was full of shame, full of guilt, full of condemnation, full of anger, full of bitterness, full of unforgiveness. Now, there came a time where I was delivered from that place of physical abuse, but I still wasn't free. Because you see, just like the children of Israel, they came out of Egypt, but Egypt was still in them. You can be delivered from your physical situation, but you can still be full of all of your old thinking, all of your old mindsets, all of your old patterns of destructive behavior. So God says, for 11 days, I'm going to take you through a wilderness so that we can get Egypt out of you. Because you're going to go in and possess the land and you can't have the same mindset in the promised land as you did when you were in slavery. I need to renew your mind so that you can walk in a whole different ability. You see, that's why promised land churches and wilderness churches and churches still bound in slavery they never understand each other. I'll get to that in a moment and you'll see why there's such a disparity. Now, the fact is, we come to this place. I'm not preaching any of that, of what I just said to you. That's just to give you some context. So what happens is, after all of this time, an entire generation died in the wilderness, because that's what will happen. If one generation doesn't do it, God will raise up another to go in and possess the promise. So a whole generation died, and we're picking up the text right at this point. We're picking up the text right on the edge of the promised land. Finally, finally. They're going into possess. I believe we are there in America right at this moment. That a whole generation of doubt and murmuring and grumbling and unbelief and fear and negativity is dying in the wilderness. And God's raised up another generation that is about to go in and possess the land. Now, a generation is not an age thing. I'm 49 and I'm in this. The dictionary says a generation is a group of people who are alive at the same time. So if you woke up this morning and there was not a white chalk mark around your body, it means you're alive. In case you're wondering, it means God's not finished with you yet, that your greatest days are ahead of you and not behind you, that God's still got a plan, purpose and destiny for your life. So they're standing right there on the edge of the promised land. But the Lord says, before you go in, you'd think now they're about to go in and just take the land. The Lord says there's six things I need you to do before you go in and possess the church. Can I just say at every level of our Christian life, when God has taken us in to possess a new territory, to take more of the land, there's always these same things we have to come back and do in our life no matter what. The first thing the Lord says in Joshua chapter 5, he says, circumcise the Israelites again. I love it in the New King James. It says, again, the second time. And you go, why? Because a generation that had come out of slavery, out of bondage, they had had their own cutting away. They had paid their own price. But the Lord says, now that this next generation is going to go in and possess the promise, they're not going into the promised land based on the price that was paid by the generation before them. They have to pay their own price. They have to have their own cutting away. There is always a cutting away that happens. You and I today are in church and this didn't just happen. Somebody paid a price for your cute little Rusty Dusty to sit in that seat. Somebody paid a price for you to be able to see me on the screen and be able to hear me. Before most of us got up this morning, especially the 1145s, there were people already here praying and interceding and believing God for today's services. There are people out in the parking lot. There are people downstairs with our children. There are people reading the Bible to our kids, raising them up. Somebody's paid a price. This doesn't just happen. 
But the Lord would say, this is awesome. You have what you have based on the price that was paid. But if you're going to go in and possess more of the land, then we've got to pay our own price. Every one of us has got to have our own cutting away. In New Testament, the writer to the Hebrews puts it this way. He says in Hebrews chapter 12, Therefore then, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside what? The weights and the sins. And the fact that the writer to the Hebrews says that we should lay aside weights and sins suggest to me there's a difference between a weight and a sin. So maybe you're not moving on into the next level of your life, not because there's a big sin in your life, but perhaps because there's a weight. You go, well, what do you mean, Christine? Well, it could be the people that you're hanging out with. And they might even be good Christian people, heaven bound. But the truth is you get into a faith environment like this, you take 10 steps forward, then you get around them, and all of a sudden you've just taken five steps back. Those same people that maybe catapulted you this far have now become a weight, an anchor, and they're holding you back from the purposes of God. It could be who's speaking into your life. They might not even be, uh, you know, people that are born again. Now, we all need to have everyone in our lives as friends, but if you're getting your counsel, from people that are not even moving in the same direction as you, then they've become a weight, an anchor. You might be believing God for financial breakthrough. And the truth is you've been giving at this level and it's good. It's not a sin. But the Lord says your next level of breakthrough is to now start giving here. So now if you keep giving here, this has now become a weight, an anchor. It's holding you back from the purposes of God. Every time we go to open a new A21 office, it's really not dependent on what people give us. Nick and I know and we've learned uh, over the years, it's based on our giving. It's our giving that determines how much we're going to receive down the track and what we're going to do. So for some of you, your next level of breakthrough actually is going to come by giving at a whole new level. It could come at a level of serving in church. Well, you've been serving at this level and it's good. But you know, when I started going to Hillsong Church um, 20, nearly 27 years ago, we had a morning service and a night service. And that was awesome when you had 400 people in the church. So you only needed to serve at one of those morning or night services. But I flew home just to do our Easter last weekend in Australia. And that, that day alone in one city were 53 services, let alone our 12 churches around the world, but just in that one, one place. Over 70,000 people in that one place. In well, you know what? You can all clap, but it took a whole lot more service than it did 26 years ago when we only had two churches, two services. And so you might be believing for breakthrough for your family. But you know what? You don't realize your next level of breakthrough is to maybe turn that TV off and begin to serve at another time. What that will do for your family, you have no idea. You know, it's amazing to me how much time we spend watching reality TV. I am convinced if we got a real life, we wouldn't need to watch anybody else's life on TV. And we could get on with what it is that God wants us to do. But I could keep you here all morning just on that. But the writer to the Hebrews doesn't just say waits. He says waits and Sins. It's not a very vogue word, is it? In our postmodern, secularized, privatized, pluralized 21st century, we all like to think I'm going to Nirvana in a Tirana, eating a piranha, hugging a whale, kissing a tree, umming our way to nothingness. I'm okay, you're okay. I don't know if you've read the news lately, we're not okay. The world is not okay. Just in case you're wondering. You know, if I, we think, you know, I don't want to offend anyone. I don't want to offend anyone. It's, it's amazing to me how we've confused in our generation tolerance with endorsement. And so we think that to tolerate means we must endorse. Can you just give me that bottle of water, Nick? So if I had a bottle here, this is the love of God. It's God's kindness that leads us to repentance. So if we try to take that attribute away from God and say, you're not really being kind because there's nothing to repent from, then we've really missed the plot. But if I had a bottle here and it said poison, and I ripped that poison label off, and I put a new label on there, chocolate syrup. And then I put that in your refrigerator. You would think I'm crazy. Because the milder you make the label, the more potent you make the poison. So what we've done to a generation is said, oh, nothing is sinful. Now drink the poison and die. Rather than saying there is a sin, but there is an antidote to sin. And it's the blood of Jesus Christ of Nazareth that still sets us free. And it's love and grace and mercy that brings that breakthrough to people. Let me give you an example, because most of us, when I use that sin word, we instantly think of one or two behaviors as if somehow Christianity is a behavior modification program. So let me just put that to bed for you. I was full of purpose and destiny. When we would be in church, from the very early days I got saved, any prophet that would come through would prophesy back then what I'm doing today. They would pick me out of any crowd. 
pretty much what I'm doing today. But you know what? A lot of my friends got amazing prophetic words as well, and they're not doing today what they were supposed to. And go, what is the difference? Many of them far more gifted than me, far more articulate than me. There is no doubt about that. When I preached at our Bible college, the dean of the college stood up straight after me and said to everyone, Christine Kane, you, I was Christine Carrioffles at the time, Christine Carrioffles, you will never preach publicly. You are that bad. So I know how to feel, how to feel good about yourself. But anyway, um, anyway, he's dead and I'm not. But anyway, that's another point. <laughs> We'll just move right on. That's, that's another sermon. <laughs> another sermon. But the, here's the, the fact of the matter. I could have had a thousand prophetic words, but because I was so broken from my past, I had so much unforgiveness in my heart. Now, I could have got all the prophetic words and I could have all the gift and talent, but not be operating where God would want me to operate. Not because those words weren't true or not because I wasn't gifted, but my sin of unforgiveness would have been the thing that would have been holding me back. My sin of so many other things, shame, guilt, condemnation, anger. I work for some of the strongest men in Christendom. Could you imagine if I had to listen to well-meaning Christians? Well, no wonder Christine can't forgive. Look what happened to her. I mean, she was abused by all those men. No wonder she can't submit to one church. No wonder she can't submit to a male leader. No wonder she can't be under any authority. And we excuse what the Bible never excuses. And God says, Chris, if you would just deal with the unforgiveness in your heart, I have this purpose and destiny ahead for you. See, we think it's a behavior. We think it's who I'm sleeping with or who I'm not. But God says, oh, I'm far more interested with what's going on in your heart. If you'd let me to get go if you'd let me deal with what's going on in your heart your behavior will take care of itself I'm here to transform your heart and that sin needs to be laid aside so that you can walk freely into the fullness of what I have for you so the writer to the Hebrew says let's lay aside the weight and the sin so if we're going to move on into the purposes of God there's some things you need to let go of there's some sins that need to be dealt with the thing that you've justified that addiction that habit that thought pattern, that unforgiveness, that bitterness, that envy, that guile, that greed, that offense. The things that the Bible says, look, if you would just let that go, it is amazing where you will go if you let that go because it's holding you back. The second thing for the sake of time, which I can't even see a clock, so I need one somewhere. The second thing that the writer to the Hebrew, uh, that, that um, Joshua, the Lord says to Joshua, First thing he said to him was circumcise the sons of Israel again the second time. Circumcise it, cut it away. The second thing the scripture says is they stopped and they kept the Passover that day. Now what scripture tells today we know that the Passover is symbolic of Jesus and the price that he paid for us. I want you to understand this church. That before they went into the promised land, they stopped to fill themselves with Jesus. And I think the Lord wants us to know that at every level before God takes us in to possess a new aspect of freedom, a new aspect of the promise that he has for us, because God's word is full of promise, emotionally, spiritually, relationally, financially, physically, every realm of life, there are promises. And we go as Christians from faith to faith, from um, grace to grace, from glory to glory. You don't settle this side of eternity. We keep moving up and into what God has for us. There is more land to possess. There are more people to be reached. There are more people to be helped. There are more people to be saved. We've got to keep moving as a church. We didn't come here to settle. You don't come, you don't settle on this side of eternity. And so we've got more of the land to take, but we've got to stop at every level and fill ourselves with Jesus. I wonder what you're filling yourself with every day. I wonder. I think at every level of my life, to be honest with you, the more and more the Lord gives me out there, the less and less distractions I have in here, I seem to just be honing down and just going, you know what, really his word, his presence. Are you still hungry for him? Are you still hungry for him? I'll tell you, and it's not like I'm not, I'm not legalistic about anything, but I, I probably watch three minutes of TV a week, I think. People go, how do you have time to do what you do? It's amazing how much time you've got when you stop doing things you shouldn't be doing. It's amazing. It's amazing. So my deal is, I don't know what it is, but what's feeding you? What's nourishing you? He says, stop. And it's all about Jesus. You know, at my level, 
It's not about the next speaking opportunity, the next book, the next this, the next that. None of that is ever going to satisfy you. You're in the city where you know that, that you can reach the top of anything and it's never going to satisfy you. Let's as Christians not sell out for what we're telling the world will never satisfy them. Let's not try to get our nutrition from the very success performance indicators that the world does. How about the fact that Christ is enough, that he is the bread of life, that he is enough for us to be nourished on, that in him... We have access to everything. What are you filling yourself with? What are you filling yourself with? So the Lord says, no, it's all about Jesus. When we talk about new campuses as a church, when we talk about the movement advancing, we're not talking about bricks and mortar. We're talking about getting the name of Jesus out there. We're talking about reaching more people with Jesus. This whole deal is all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. So he says, I want you to stop. And fill yourself with Jesus. He then goes on, and I love this. It says, then the manna ceased. The manna ceased. It's amazing, isn't it? God says, I'm not doing it that way anymore. Saddest thing is when people don't realize God's not doing what he did. Just because he did it for 40 years doesn't mean he's going to do it like he did it then. For 40 years, the children of Israel didn't even need faith anymore. Some of you have got so many Christian... Uh, habits you don't need faith anymore you haven't operated in faith for 40 years because this is how God's always done it we wake up and we know when God's going to drop it out of the sky because this is the formula and this is what works and God says that's awesome because in the wilderness that's how you can survive but I don't do things in the promised land like I did them in the wilderness he says to Joshua I want you to dig your own wells I want you to plant your own corn I'm going to tap into the potential that I put on the inside of you I'm going to act Activate my principle of seed time and harvest and that's why a wilderness Christian will never understand a promised land Christian a wilderness Christian will always say they're just full of prosperity they just want money because they never understand because someone with a wilderness mentality will never understand how a promised land Christian lives never ever will they understand that so don't try to argue with a Christian or a church that lives in the wilderness because God says I'm not doing it like that anymore and what you have is certain people, churches all around the world, you ought to thank God you're planted here, that are sitting there. And because God once moved on some song 40 years ago, every Sunday they keep going back and singing Noah's Ark's greatest hits, trying to get some nutritional value out of that song. But that manna is stale and moldy and they are dying and dehydrated going back, trying to get what God once did. And the Lord said, the manna has ceased. The manna ceased. Some of you are so stuck back in what once happened. A teacher said, you're dumb, you're stupid. A spouse left you, said you're not lovable. A, a parent said, I wish you were never born. You failed miserably and you got stuck in that moment. That one offense, that one hurt, that one chapter. And you've allowed that to define every other moment of your life. You know, I was abused for 12 years, church. Nothing will ever change that. The blood of Jesus does not give you amnesia. It gives you a life beyond your past. That's what it does. So it's not that none of that will change. But although I was abused for 12 years and nothing will ever change that, I have not been being abused for 37 years. So why would I allow 12 years to dominate my entire life and destiny when I haven't been being abused for a whole lot longer than I have been being abused? Some of you have been stuck in one moment, one offence, one failure and you've allowed that to define every other moment and you have made what someone has done to you bigger than what Jesus did for you. What Jesus did for you is greater than anything anyone has ever done to you. What Jesus did for you is greater. And at some point, you have got to believe that. This world will be turned upside down when Christians actually believe what we preach. Christine, it's different for you. What is different for me? I fit every government funding category in my nation. I grew up in the poorest zip code in my, in my state, the third poorest zip code in Australia, in government assistant migrant housing. So marginalised because of my ethnicity and my gender. I mean, how much worse does it get than being left in a hospital, unnamed and unwanted? Abused for 12 years. So I, so I fit everything. I'm a marginalised, depressed dispossessed, poor, ethnic, minority, abused, adopted chick. It's awesome. I could make a fortune out of government funding because they fund people like me. They give me a label, victim, 
And they say, come and collect your check every week and we'll remind you that you're a victim. But church, I read the book and my Bible says he's redeemed my life from the pit. I am more than a victim. We are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus who strengthens us. We are not victims because of the redemptive work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And I am not just trying to fire you up. I wish you would get this into your bones. Because so many of us live as delivered victims rather than as free bond slaves of Christ. Oh, that changes everything. It changes everything. We live as delivered victims in the wilderness for our whole Christian life rather than free bond slaves in the promised land. My life's not my own. I was bought with a price. I'm a bond slave of Christ. I rescue slaves, but I am a slave to Jesus, but I live in total freedom as a slave to Christ. Oh, it changes everything. Changes everything. And so he says, this is what I need you to do. I need you to move on. The man has ceased. You're not there anymore. I'm not doing it how I did it anymore. You're not stuck in that moment anymore. It's time to move on. What do you do, church? What do you do when you've cut certain things away? When you've filled yourself with Jesus and you're honoring the Lord, when you've moved on and into and said, God, I'm part of this movement, I'm planted in this house, we're advancing, we're building campuses, we're having great opportunities to serve the community, we're seeing awesome things. What do you do when you've done all of that right and you're doing it all? And then you think, I'm about, you hit chapter six now, I've I've done it all and and now I'm about to step in to the promised land. What do you do when you do all of that and then you walk, you think, God, You've turned up. You've pushed back. Here you are. You've split the Red Sea. You have killed the Egyptian army. You have provided for me for 40 years. I can testify to your goodness. You have pushed back the River Jordan. Yet another miracle. And we've walked across. What do you do when you've done all of that and you think I am now about to eat? of the milk and honey. I'm now about to go in and possess the promise and the first thing you walk into in the promised land, you're not in the wilderness anymore, you're now in the promised land. And the first thing you walk into is a wall. It's the last thing most of us expect when we walk into that promised land, don't we? A wall. And we go, God, you just did, you just not only kept us alive, you, you pushed back the, the River Jordan. You, you've just done a whole other miracle, God. This is it. We're going in to possess the promise. You've been believing, God, you've done it all right. And suddenly that kid just goes AWOL. Suddenly that marriage, what just happened? Suddenly that doctor's report, just what just happened, God? I'm doing everything I know to do. I'm in faith. I'm, I, I've done everything you told me to do. What do you do when you land in Sydney in 2014, 15? What year was it? 2014 to speak at your Hillsong conference and you woke up a week before that with just a sore throat and then I land in Sydney and the, at 8 o'clock and then the doctor calls me at 9 o'clock in the morning from America and says, Christine, your biopsy's just come back and you have cancer. And you're like, wow, what do you do? When you're not expecting a wall and you're in the promised land and all of a sudden th- th- there's a wall, I don't know what it might be for you. But Christine, we're not sure If it's gone across your throat, it's on your larynx and under your trachea. Guess where your voice box is, everybody? Right there. So we don't know exactly what it might be. So what do you do when you hit a wall? Because at every level in the promised land, oh, there are always walls. I love my mama Joyce always says, Christine, new levels, new devils. You don't have to worry about that. They're always going to come everywhere you go. And so what do you do? Because the Bible says the city of Jericho was tightly shut up. No one came out. And no one came in. That was it. It was it. God's not blind. But he said, the Lord said unto Joshua, I want you to see the promise on the other side of the wall. I want you to get your eyes off the wall. And I want you to get your eyes on the promise on the other side of the wall. There is nothing you can do to make this wall come down. But I am God and I can do what needs to be done to get this wall to come down. I need you to stay in faith. I need you to march around this wall six times and I don't want you to stop. I want you to keep going. Some of you, you're on the edge of giving up because you hit a wall that you were not expecting and you think, God, you're not faithful. God, I've been in faith. I've honoured you. I've served you. I've done everything you said. And God says, you know what? I need you to do another lap. Keep praying. Keep serving. Keep going to church. Keep turning up and doing what you need to do. Keep honouring God. 
and you need to take another lap. You need to keep going around and you might be on lap three, day seven. You don't even know. You might be on lap six, day seven. What you've got to do is take another lap. Take another lap and don't stop. Because God says, oh, this wall will come down. This wall will come down. I've got this wall. But I need you in faith. I need you to see what I see. I need you to build your life on the facts, on the truth of my word and not the facts of your circumstances. So, Christine, what do you know? Well, God, I know a whole lot of scriptures about healing. So, Christine, I need you to start declaring and decreeing those. I need you to start speaking your healing. I know the facts and the facts are there is a mass. But there's a truth, Christine, that by my stripes you are healed. And so, Christine, and I remember saying to the doctor, I said to her when she, I go, you know, she, she, I go, Leslie, it's okay. I've been like counselling the doctor. I go, Leslie, it's okay. I said, cancer's not terminal. Life is terminal. Just live long enough. No one gets out of it alive. Everyone dies. It's okay. I said, whichever way this goes, I'm going to win. Either God's going to supernaturally heal me or I'm going to get healed in surgery or Jesus is going to take me home. Option A, I win. Option B, I win. Option C, I win. There, I cannot lose for winning in all of this. I win. And so are you going to make the wall bigger than your God? And that's why the scripture says, magnify the Lord. You can't make God any bigger than God is as big as he needs to be. He's omnipotent, he's omniscient, he's omnipresent. He's as big as he needs to be or big as he's ever going to be. But the God of the universe is made big or small in the hearts of people. And so what you choose to magnify, to make bigger. Why do we start with worship? We, you know, contrary to what some people think, we're not just trying to sing songs here to wait for all the late people to come to church. That's not what we're doing. <laughs> Have you ever noticed you could come in here and you've got the weight of the world on your shoulders? And God says, look, if you would just start looking up, if you would just begin to declare and decree who I am and begin to make me bigger than that pain, than that struggle, than that hurt, than that offense, you might leave here and nothing circumstantially has changed, but everything's changed because your perspective's changed because you've just made God bigger than any opposition in your life. That's why we don't miss church. We're not playing games here. We're staying alive. And so I remember going, okay, this is the fact. There is the cancer report, but here is the truth. And I would every morning with Nick, and he's told a very small circle of people, the people that you surround yourself with are critical. We spoke nothing but faith, nothing but declaring and decreeing the truth of God's word. He says, I need you to see the truth. And I need you to make the truth bigger than the facts. Because the facts can change, Christine, but the truth has the power to change things. And the truth can change things and then the facts will change. So he says, I need you to listen to this battle plan. And you know, God's battle plans, church, are always weird. Every time you're going in to take more of the land, there's nothing normal about them. So just live with it. Because the Lord says to Joshua, this is what you're going to do. You're going to march around. You know, once a day for six days, then on the seventh day, you're going to do it six times and then seven times and then we're going to shout and the wall's going to come down. Now these are, history tells you this, the most heavily fortified walls in ancient history. 30 foot high, impenetrable walls. And God goes, yeah, yeah, toga, sandals, chauffeur, march around, blow, awesome. (laughs) Could you imagine Joshua going, awesome, God, is there a plan B? Some cruise missiles, nuclear bombs, something. AK-47s, anything. Pistol shooter, water pistol, what, anything. And then he's thinking, you know, I could just imagine him. He goes, I've got to go back and tell them God's plan. This is how every pastor feels every week, just in case you're wondering, okay? So, okay. And then we're going to have the naysayers that think it's their job to tell us how dumb a plan it is, as if we don't know that it's dumb. Thank you very much for telling us. And so what happens is that they're going to come and say, it's impossible. As if we don't know. And so Josh was thinking, last time this happened was in Numbers 13. And 10 guys came back with a negative report and kept an, ent- kept an entire generation out of their destiny. And because they all murmured and grumbled and complained. And then we did laps in Mount si- around Mount Sinai for 40 years. And Josh was thinking, I've got the t-shirt, I've got the DVD, I've got the book series, I'm done. So he came back and that's why I read all the way to chapter 10, to verse 10 in chapter 6. He said, there's not a word that's going to come out of your mouth. And let me give you the Christine version of that. 
Joshua came back to the people and he said, Thus saith the Lord, shutteth, uppeth. <laughs> if you cannot say what God says, don't say anything. Don't say anything. Listen to why. Because doubt dies unborn if it's never spoken. And we need a generation of Christians that stop being naysayers, that stop uh, articulating doubt and fear and negativity. And you know what? Until you can say what God says, don't say anything. Most of us are making matters worse because our confession normally aligns itself with our circumstances, with our past, with our friends, with our feelings and with our experience. And God says, until you can get your confession to align itself with the truth of my word stop talking about the facts of your feeling or the facts of your circumstances or the facts of what's going on make the truth higher than the facts so if you can't say what I say say nothing nothing and so if you and I are going to go in and keep possessing oh, just so that you don't all freak out let me just say by the grace of God I had as you can see a surgery and I am totally cancer free by God's grace God is so gracious so gracious and in my case he was awesome i need to take no medication by god's grace i'm strong and healthy and healed and believing to see so much more of that on the earth today so much more of that but church you're only just so ready to pop as a church and don't settle for living delivered in the wilderness when you can have freedom in the promised land in every sphere of your life, emotionally, relationally, spiritually, financially, and physically, but at every level. If you want what God says you can have, you have got to make a decision consistently to cut away certain things. You've got to make a decision daily to fill yourself with Jesus. You've got to make a decision to keep moving on from where you were, both good and bad. Some people, if they came from Hillsong, they would have got stuck in 1995, shout to the Lord. If we were still singing shout to the Lord, we would be bored to the Lord down at Hillsong. We just wouldn't do that. And so the fact is, some of you, you're still stuck in your football days from college, except you haven't been in college for 40 years. And you haven't moved on from that moment, both good and bad. You've got to move on to where the Lord is now. Now. And then what you have to do is see what God sees and say what God says and what I didn't have time and you can read it in the rest of chapter 6 where the Lord said the first fruits of the increase they're all mine they're all mine when you go into that promised land the first fruits are always God see it's amazing to me how many of us we step into the blessing of God and then we use what God has blessed us with as an excuse to stop giving to God as an excuse to stop coming to church see God bless me with a boat now I can't fit Sundays in anymore because I like to go out on my boat oh it's amazing how many people just use God for the blessing and then forget the God of the blessing and there's an interesting thing that happens in the midst of all of that but you need to go home and read the rest of chapter six so if you want to have what God says you can have you've got to keep cutting away certain things you've got to keep filling yourself with Jesus you've got to keep moving on you've got to see what God sees you've got to say what God says and remember at every level the first fruits of all of our increase are always God's friend I wonder if you know this God that I'm talking about today. Because if you want to possess the promises of God, friend, then you have to be in an authentic relationship with the possessor of those promises. And his name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. The same Jesus that stepped into the heart and life of this girl that was left in a hospital unnamed and unwanted. This girl that was sexually abused for 12 years. That same Jesus that wiped away the mess of my past, that gave me a brand new start and a hope for the future. He's the same Jesus that's in this room today. Friend, it doesn't matter where you've been, what you've done, what's happened to you, that same Jesus can wipe away the mess of your past, give you a brand new start today, this moment. And here is the kick by good news. He gives us a hope for the future. 